You know what can go fuck itself? Blu-ray. Why do they keep releasing these Blu-ray DVD combo packs? I know it's intended to be for people who are still transitioning from DVDs to Blu-ray, but who is this really applicable for anymore? Most people who have bought into the blue craze have already done so, and now they're still being forced to buy DVDs with their Blu-rays. I don't know, if I was still being forced to buy VHS tapes with my DVDs, I'd be kind of peeved. And let's not even touch the concept of digital copies. Talk about your vestigial additions to a still more expensive option. You want to watch Wally on Blu-ray? Well here, buy the Blu-ray and the DVD and the digital copy, all for a couple pennies under $40. The funny thing is, anybody who adores Blu-ray probably thinks this is a good deal, because these are the sort of people content with shelling out ridiculous amounts of money for anything with that new car smell. Wow! Anyway, you know what can really go fuck itself? Hello, Reach. No, 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 specifically Bungie. Anybody who knows me, the poor unfortunate souls that they are, knows that I love Halo. I always have and I probably always will, despite what Reach has done to the franchise. So I think for this review of sorts to be appropriate, you need to sit through some painstaking background. I've always been a fan of video games, ever since my hands were big enough to hold a paddle. There are a few genres of games I disliked, as long as they were handled well. Though my favorite kind seemed to be platformers back in the day. The one genre I could never touch were FPS's, and Spyro games for some reason. Whether it was Perfect Dark or GoldenEye, FPS games always gave me a frightful case of motion sickness, and if I dared to play them or even watch them for too long, the only way to console me was to give me a reaffirming rub on the back while turning out all the lights and letting me watch Animal Crackers on Teletoon in silence. This all changed with Halo. I was very skeptical about Halo when it first came out. Massive praise or not, this game was still an FPS and therefore was intent on making me feel like I had just slurped out a gooey duck out of its shell. But I gave Halo a try anyway, and after some considerable time, was blown away. Not just by the fact that it was fun, that it looked great, or that it was genuinely challenging. What surprised me the most was it didn't give me any sense of motion sickness at all. Halo seemed to have a much more fluid sense of movement, and so doing made me produce all kinds of fluids. <laughs> Everyone in the game industry seems to share the opinion, unless they're fucking morons, that Halo revolutionized the FPS for consoles. I agree with this assessment, though mostly for the fact that it made the genre playable for poor chaps like me. I played the hell out of that game. I love the bright and colorful alien blood, going up against the challenge of two hunters, and yes, even the horror of the flood. It was an epic video game adventure, and one that didn't end in single player. For anyone born in the late 90s, or God help us later than that who might be listening, let me explain something, and hopefully your ADHD-riddled minds will grasp the concept. Back in the old black and white days of video games, the term multiplayer meant you had to have friends in real life. Nice pose, Rob. <laughs> and they had to have the same video game system as you. And they often had to have more than one controller, because usually there was some forgetful twat who would come over and say, Hey guys, let's play Super Smash Bros. and then not have his own fucking controller. This was the original Halo. It wasn't besting random seven-year-olds in England, it was besting your friends. It was personal. If someone camped with the Rockets, you were able to lean over and slap them across their ugly faces. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was accused of looking at the other person's screen for every kill. Look screening. No! I'm not trying to say online gaming sucks. In fact, the implementation of playing online is what draws me to games more now than anything else. For example, I loved Donkey Kong Country as a child. Played the fuck out of it. Even beat it once, I think, though with all those horrible bees haunting my memory, who can remember? So when Donkey Kong Country Returns came out for the Wii, I was very excited and got it pretty quickly. You know how many times I've played it since I got it? None. Why? Because I'm almost a fucking level 50 in Red Dead Redemption and that douchebag just cut me off in Blur and I've got to meet three other people at five to blow the heads off some cell shaded fucks in Borderlands and then i got to go curse someone out in Gears of War 2 for only being able to stay alive by glitching out of the map. You see what I mean? Plus, Donkey Kong Country Returns has no achievements. Where's the incentive, Nintendo? Good old classic fun. Nobody plays with that anymore. Not when we could be owning noobs. Right, so naturally when Halo 2 came out and was going to have online play, this was an incredible prospect. I pre-ordered that bastard in the collector's edition steelbook and it was still the best $70 I've ever spent. 
Well, apart from that lung I needed off the black market. But anyway, the online play in Halo 2 wasn't the only thing that made Halo 2 so spectacular. Even to this day, it's hard for me to believe both Halo 1 and Halo 2 were on the same console. Halo 2 pushed that fucker to the very limits in terms of absolutely everything, from graphics to gameplay, and the online aspect was great, I don't care what anyone says. In fact, the multiplayer was so good that I used to host parties wherein the sole purpose was to gather a bunch of people and put two TVs and Xboxes in the room and blast the shit out of each other. Nice pose, Rob. You might be thinking my fond feelings of Halo 2 has more basis in nostalgia than actual facts, and to that I say, fuck you! Nostalgia is that little scapegoat word people use to defend the fact that they were of the supreme minority who disliked Halo 2, which is another way of saying they sucked. You're stuck in balls! So then Halo 3 came out, which I loved as well, though it did seem a tad underwhelming. Still, even with little to revolutionize the age-old gameplay, it seemed Bungie was intent on adhering to the if-it-ain't-broke-don't-fix-it philosophy, and instead decided to pack the game full of extra features that were unheard of for a console FPS at the time. By Halo 3, I'd become fully consumed by the Halo monster. I bought Halo Wars, I bought Halo Legends, I looked into and learned all there was to know about the expansive Halo universe. All this is pretty irrelevant to my thoughts on the games and how they play as games, but I'm simply trying to emphasize how much I had really fallen in love with the franchise. It's such a rich imaginative world that was beginning to transcend its original video game format. Books, comics, spin-offs, short films, anime... Halo had become more to me than just sticking people in the face with plasma grenades. Fuck! Fuck! Yes! I rule my world! So what does this all have to do with Halo Reach being not so hot? To understand that, you first have to look back at how Halo 2 and Halo 3 played online. You see, both Halo 2 and Halo 3 had something called balance. To dumb this down into the simplest of terms, this meant that if someone is using Technique A, then there must always be a Technique B, which meant there was always a counter for every possible encounter. It's over, Anakin! Oh, I have a <laughs> <laughs> Now you might be saying to yourself, what are you talking about? I've never been able to capture some guy who had a rocket. And the only response I can come up with that is, that's because you're bad and you should probably stop playing before I get paired up with you and I have to cuss you out for making me lose. A player who was good at Halo wasn't someone who always rushed rockets, it was someone who didn't just look at what's at the end of his gun. Bad players didn't know how to use their ears, they didn't know how to watch their radar. I lost count a long time ago how many times I've been able to follow an enemy halfway across the map and they didn't even turn around because they're not looking at their fucking radar. And don't try to tell me Halo 2 and Halo 3 was in balance because that's a one-way ticket to Wrongsville. Population, you and the Pope. In all my years of playing Halo, I've never called the game unbalanced until Reach came out. Oh my god, he's finally talking about Halo Reach. Yes, this is the main thing that strikes me about Halo Reach, the lack of balance. But let me get back to that and instead talk about a smaller but still more important gripe first. Flow. And no, I'm not talking about PIS! Halo 3 introduced equipment you could pick up and throw on the ground. In Reach, Bungie decided to scrap these and put in armor abilities instead, most of which throw the flow of gameplay totally out of whack. You may not be aware of it, but there's a pace to an online magic game. It's only when you mess with it that it becomes noticeable, so let's all thank Bungie for showing us that. If you were stupid, you might be saying, But wait, where was the counter for the bubble shield or the regenerator in Halo 3? Well, for one thing, I'm not talking about balance right now. Pay attention! And for another, you could use them too! That was the nice thing about equipment, was your bubble shield may have protected you from that asshole sniping across the map, but if Mr. Shotgun Happy was nearby, he could enter your little cocoon and fuck your shit up! Plus, in Halo 3, you had to pick up equipment. You weren't regenerating another regenerator every 10 seconds, unlike in Reach, where every ability has a constant respawn time, none of which take very long and disrupt the gameplay flow even more consistently. Let's take the most obvious example. Armor lock. Oh no, complaining about armor lock, that is so September 2010. Well, listen up, folks, because there's a reason people freak the fuck out over it. Bungie, in their infinite wisdom, thought it was far too easy to die in previous Halo games. The standard, I'm being shot, and if I can't find cover or don't have a bubble shield, I'm going to die aspect of the game, which applies to every bloody game, was apparently too frustrating. Thus, the implementation of armor lock. 
essentially a get out of jail free card. It's not the fact that it screws you out of a kill every goddamn time, it's the fact that if you still want your kill, and everybody does, you have to wait around for them to come out of it. This is like watching Die Hard, you know, you're experiencing a glorious adrenaline rush, John McClane is just about to cap some German bastard, and then he has to stop for six buzz-killing, soul-crushingly long seconds to get a splinter out of his thumb. You're fucking with the pace of the game! It's bad enough people are high on just about nabbing a sweet kill and then it's taken away from them, but then they have to stand there, looking absolutely retarded, and being totally open to any other enemy who might waltz by, especially if the dude in armor lock is blurring into his mic for help. It's a complete zap of energy. Let me touch on balance again for a second. Where is the counter to the armor lock? There was a counter to everything in previous Halo games, but this one truly has me stumped. You can't wait standing next to him with your balls in his face preparing him for the inevitable teabagging he's merely delaying because if you stand too close you get EMP'd and he'll fuck you up. You can't melee him out of it because once again you get EMP'd. You can't go around to ninja his ass when he comes out of it because not only can you look in all directions in armor lock, if you choose to face backwards and then release the lock you're suddenly facing in that direction. There is no bloody counter other than spamming grenades like an idiot. Grenades that shouldn't have been wasted on this dick because he should be in the ground already! Another armor ability I dislike is the sprint. It's bad enough when you're fighting someone wielding a sword or a shotgun, but giving them the option to sprint is like pumping them full of cocaine. They're gonna fuck you up Tony Montana style and there's nothing you can do about it except scream. What's worse are the people who use sprint to double melee. I think some people are just dicks. Last I checked, this was a first-person shooter. You want to punch people, then go play Mortal Kombat, or go to a Neil Diamond concert. I understand the need to speed up your movement in Halo, especially since every other FPS has a sprint functionality, though not one that runs out after five seconds, like your Spartan is actually Homer Simpson in that suit. And certainly, if any Halo game needed a quick injection of caffeine, it's the mind-numbingly slow reach, but this is just abusing a good thing. Plus, I feel like Sprint is used as a get-out-of-jail-free card as well, though it's a little more legitimate than Armor Lock, because you still have to run away. If you play Reach regularly, though, you know how frustrating it is when you've depleted the guy's shields and they just take off around the corner like the Roadrunner. But really, why do we have this ability? If we're going to have it, shouldn't it not be an ability and just something your Spartan can naturally do? Not only does that make more sense, but it would reduce the amount of people being fuckheads or running away from their comeuppance, because I'd be able to sprint after them and tear them apart like the wounded gazelles they are. The other abilities like Jetpack, Hologram, and Invisibility all work pretty well for what they do. There's enough drawbacks and benefits to them to make them fair. Vade should have been kept exclusive to elites like in the beta. And on that note, they should have kept the invasion colors green and purple. I still can't fathom why that was changed. Were people going to get confused as to what team they're on? It says in big blue letters at the start whether you're a Spartan or an Elite. The green and purple colors weren't just a fresh change of pace, they felt a little more canonical, like we were really in the Human Covenant War and that ten-year-old controlling that Elite over there had to fucking die for the good of mankind. But other than that, yeah, I don't have a huge problem with the armor abilities besides what I've mentioned, except... Well, I don't know. There's just this little nagging fear I always seem to have when I enter a game now. The armor abilities are wild cards. You have absolutely no way to predict. And people can change them willy-nilly every single time they die. You've got no way of telling if the guy you're facing is going to turn invisible, or fly up in the air, or roll a ridiculous 10 feet to the right. And the fact that his armor ability could be what gives him the upper hand is just what makes the whole thing a crapshoot. Well, actually, what makes the whole thing a crapshoot is Bloom, but oh, we'll get to that. This is just an example.